Hi, I'm Jerry Rodriguez at AstroPix.com. Today we're going to take a look at the iOptron Sky Guider. The iOptron Sky Guider is a very basic German equatorial mount for wide field astrophotography. You'll be able to take images like this one of the constellation of Cassiopeia. This was shot with a DSLR and a 50mm lens on the iOptron Sky Guider mount. Because it has a counterweight, the Sky Guider can carry a heavier payload than the Sky Tracker. iOptron rates the payload at 11 pounds with 7.7 .7 pounds of counterweights. Now the counterweight that comes with it is only 3.5 pounds, so if you're going to put that heavy of a payload on it, you're going to need to add an additional counterweight. The Sky Guider mount cost $479, and it comes with the counterweight shaft, the counterweight, the poloscope, and the poloscope illuminator. It does not come with the ball head. If you want to purchase the ball head, that's an additional $48. If you want to get the entire package with the field tripod, that'll cost you $578, again, with the ball head costing extra. The Sky Guider does not come with a hand controller, and it does not have go-to automatic pointing or slewing, and you can't control it with a computer. The Sky Guider only has a right ascension drive. It does not have any kind of declination assembly, although it does have an ST4 port for auto-guiding and right ascension. The mount weighs 5.5 pounds, and the tripod weighs 8.4 pounds. The one drawback to the mount is that when the tripod is fully extended, the polar alignment scope is only 30.5 inches above the ground, so you have to sit on the ground to polar align it. The Sky Guider comes in two very nice cases, one for the field tripod and one for the mount. So this is what's in the iOptron carry case for the mount. We've got the... Uh, 12 volt power cable here with a cigarette lighter plug, poloscope illuminator, counterweight, uh, space for the ball head, and the mount itself. There's the mount. Okay, once we've got the tripod together, we can put the mount on it. Put the center locking bolt on it. And then once we've got that, we can tighten up the tripod spreader. Now, this is swinging free here, so the first thing we want to put on is the counterweight shaft. And then we want to put the counterweight on. And once we've got the counterweight on, we'll put the counterweight safety bolt onto the bottom. Now we'll put the ball head on the top of the 3 8 16 bolt on the top of the uh, declination assembly. Take the dovetail plate off of the ball head, put it onto the bottom of our camera. Once that's down nice and tight, we'll put the dovetail back on. And then we can balance it. We always want it to be, this is pointing north, so this way is east. We always want it to be a little bit heavy on the east side, but just a little bit. Okay. That seems just about right there now. Engage the worm gear and then tighten down the mesh of the worm with the tension adjuster screw on the top. So we tighten it down all the way, but that's going to be too tight and it's going to bind. So we want to back off on it about two turns and check the, the tension by trying to wiggle the, the bottom of the Conaway shaft. We want it just loose enough so that there's no play. 
And once you get a little bit of play, then you can tighten it down just enough so that there's no play. And then that's where you want it for tracking. Once we have the camera and lens balanced with the counterweight, we can also loosen these two black bolts on the bottom of the uh, declination assembly and we can use that to move the uh, mount so that we can aim at different targets with the gear engaged. And once we have it aimed where we want it, we can lock those back down. Now we're going to polar align the scope. Take the protective metal cover off and take the cap off the front end so that we can see through the right ascension axis. And then we'll put the polar scope illuminator into the polar scope. You have to be careful because this thing is very small and easy to lose. It'll screw right in there. And we'll plug in the uh, polar scope illuminator. Back in the control box. We'll plug in a 12 volt power into the control box. Then we plug the cigarette lighter plug into a 12 volt battery to power the mount and the polar scope illuminator. And when you look through the polar scope to align on Polaris, you have to orient the reticle so that the 12 hour mark is straight up. And to do that, you have to disengage the gear. So we'll loosen the tension nut on the top and turn the gear switch and then turn it until the 12 hour mark is pointed straight up when you look through it. The iOptron Poloscope app for iPads and iPhones uses the device's built-in GPS and device time to display exactly where Polaris should be placed on the reticle by moving the mount in altitude and azimuth to achieve polar alignment. There is also a version for Android devices. Once you're polar aligned, you can re-engage the worm and adjust the worm mesh. The iOptron Sky Guider is very lightweight. It's very easy to pick up the entire mount and tripod with a camera on top of it and move it if you need to. When you first set the mount up, you're going to want to aim it roughly north. You can do this with a compass in the daytime and the magnetic declination of your observing site. Or if it's at nighttime, you can just rough aim it at Polaris. After you have the reticle and the polar finder oriented so that the 12-hour mark is straight up, we're going to adjust the mount with the azimuth adjustment bolts and the altitude turnbuckle. If you want to use the Sky Guider with a small telescope like the AT65 EDQ, the ball head is really not going to be able to hold that much weight. You're going to need to use something else and you're going to need to add an extra counterweight. So what we'll want to use with a small telescope is something like the Faisal PB70 pan head. It's got a 3 inch female thread that mounts right to the, uh, to the top of the iOptron. We're going to also need to add an extra counterweight. So we've got the AstroTech 65 EDQ on a uh, dovetail plate here. We'll put that into the Vixen saddle. And we'll loosen it, balance it in deck, and then balance it in right ascension. And once it's balanced, then we want to re-engage the worm gear. Tighten the tension down. And again, back off on it a couple of turns until it's just loose enough so that there's no play but that it doesn't bind. Then we can aim it by lock, unlocking those two adjustment bolts and aim it to wherever we want. If we flip it over, we want to shoot something on the east side. Remember, we need to rebalance. So when it's slightly heavy on the east side, so we'll just move the counterweight down a little bit. So the Faisal pan head is much better than the iOptron ball head if you're going to put something close to the weight limit of the mount on it. 
uh, it places the weight closer to the center of uh, rotation so that you don't need as many counterweights to balance it and it doesn't flex like the ball head does with a lot of weight on it. One nice thing about the Ioptron Sky Guider is that when you're going to use something with this kind of focal length you really need to guide it. Anything longer than about 200 millimeters is going to need to be guided with this mount or pretty much any mount. Um, you can put an off-axis guider on the scope and plug it in directly into the ST4 port on the back of the mount. The North America and Pelican Nebulae were shot with a 180 millimeter lens on the Sky Guider mount. 23 unguided 3 minute exposures were stacked for this image. 180 millimeters is a fairly long focal length to shoot unguided, and only about half of the 46 total frames that were shot were untrailed. On the back of the mount we have the controls on the port. We've got the ST4 auto guider plug, the north-south hemisphere switch, the rate tracking selector switch, on-off power switch, and the LED illuminator plug. The tracking rates that are available are L for lunar, S for solar, 0.5x sidereal, and 1x sidereal. 1x is what you would uh, normally track at with a normal equatorial mounting. The 0.5x sidereal rate is for skyscapes where you're trying to balance the blurring between the stars trailing and the foreground horizon trailing. On the left side of the mount we've got the altitude lock, a bubble level, and a latitude scale. If you level the mount and then dial in the latitude of your observing location, it'll help you with polar alignment. The north end of the mount has the azimuth and altitude adjustment knobs. These are used to fine-tune the position of Polaris on the reticle so that the scope is polar aligned. Another nice feature of the Sky Guider is that you can remove the counterweight shaft and counterweight and put another ball head on the other end. And if you've got two cameras, you can shoot two cameras simultaneously and double your productivity on a clear night. This wide field shot of the constellations of Gemini, Orion, Auriga, and Taurus were shot with a 16 millimeter lens mounted on a ball head on the Ioptron Sky Guider mount. Nine eight-minute exposures at ISO 800 at F2 were stacked for this image. A number of open clusters can be seen in this image of the M103 area in Cassiopeia. It was shot with a small refractor of 420 millimeters of focal length mounted on the Fisol pan head. Nine six-minute exposures at ISO 800 were auto-guided with an off-axis guider. Nine out of 13 frames were usable when auto-guided at this exposure and focal length after careful balancing and gear meshing on the mount. All in all, the Ioptron Sky Guider was a pleasure to set up and use. It's an extremely solid platform for wide-angle and telephoto lenses, and it can even hold a small telescope in a pinch. I'm Jerry Rodriguez at astropix.com. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more reviews and tutorials on DSLR astrophotography.